and uh, just summarize your question in the chat and then I will call on you in the sequence in which I receive them. Uh, I will invite you to uh, read uh, to read out or to, to, to uh, pose your question live if you wish. If you do not wish to, to ask your question yourself, I can read it out for you, but please let me know what you want. Um, and then we should have at least about 45 minutes for the Q&A after the talk. Um, I should also say that we are recording this talk. Um, we will not, however, record the question and answer session, but we will be recording the, the presentation by uh, uh, Zoe. Um, another technical um, matter I should uh, just uh, tell you about is, for those of you with small screens on your laptop, uh, it might help to hide the webcam. You can see the at the bottom of your uh, the Cultura Live screen, there's a there's a, a sort of a taskbar where you can see our faces. If you can minimize that, then you you make uh, available a bit more space to see the screen, and then you will see our um, uh, our face uh, during the when we talk. You can also move our face around, so to speak, so you have a bit more room to. Uh, to, to see the screen. So I think these are all the technical matters to, uh, to address first. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome um, Dr. Zoe Goodman. Zoe, welcome. I can see Zoe, she's uh, facing me. So if I look in that direction, you know why. Um, Zoe is an urban anthropologist uh, working in Mombasa, Kenya, uh, East Africa. Her research explores the way in which Muslims of South Asian descent have shaped urbanity and piety in the city, and how these are in turn being affected by pervasive security discourses. Uh, Zoe is a research fellow here at IAS, um, uh, and she's also a research associate in the anthropology department at SOAS, the School for Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. Um, Zoe obtained her PhD from SOAS, uh, and she has taught uh, in the anthropology department at SOAS for about two years, I think, before you joined uh, us here at IAS. Um, and I think besides uh, the current uh, topic, which is memory and the urban lives of race in Mombasa, perspectives from Kenyan Asian women, I think one of your other uh, research interests is climate change in Mombasa and specifically from the perspective of urban residents. So, um, I think so that that's my introduction. I will uh, let you say a bit more about yourself and your uh, your research topic, uh, Zoe, but it's uh, our pleasure to welcome you here and the stage is yours. I'm gonna switch off my microphone. So thanks so much, Paul. Uh, I think you need to turn the sound down on your computer. Yeah. yeah. Great, so many thanks, Paul, and thank you also to Shaolan and Anne-Marie and everyone else at IAS who has helped to make um, this webinar possible. Um, and a really big thanks to all of you in the audience for coming. I think we might still be having slight technical issues with the sound. I turned the volume off on my computer itself. Yeah, now we should be good. Okay, um, so what I'm going to be talking about today is really a rethinking of one of the chapters of my doctoral thesis, which I finished a couple of years ago. Um, so it's based on ethnography that I did in Mombasa, mostly between 2013 and 2015. But what I'm going to be arguing is actually all very new. So I'm really looking forward to your feedback and comments. So I'm going to be talking about Mombasa, which you can see on the map here. And Mombasa is a port city that has been tied to expansive Indian Ocean trading networks for over a thousand years. Indian traders, particularly those from the western coast of India, have frequented and indeed lived in Mombasa for centuries. However, it was particularly during the British colonial period from the 1880s onwards that tens of thousands of Indians from what is now Gujarat in northwestern India, so around here on the map, were encouraged to settle in Kenya and the wider East African region. The British ruled Kenya through the racialized three-tier system that separated Europeans, Indians and Black Kenyans in terms of law, policy and practice. Indians, or Asians as they would come to be known, 
have many privileges in relation to black Kenyans in terms of the kinds of jobs that they could hold, the taxation schemes that they were subjected to, and the forms of mobility and association that they could practice. This racist system was abolished at independence in 1963. However, enduring racialized antagonisms between black Kenyans and their brown or Asian counterparts um, remain to this day. Asians continue to be stereotyped as wealthy, as exploitative, as insular and racist. They're frequently castigated by other Kenyans for their alleged failure to intermarry and their kind of refusal to integrate into Kenyan society more broadly. They're often assumed to have very close ties to India. And for many of their compatriots, the Kenyanness of Kenyan Asians is suspect at best. Some of these tensions were recently exposed on Twitter. Shortly after the killing of George Floyd, this tweet appeared from Shiksha Arora, who is a prominent Kenyan Asian media personality and dancer. Shiksha tweeted, many Kenyan Indian landlords, especially in Langata and Parklands, and these are neighborhoods of the capital Nairobi, would rather leave their units empty rather than rent to certain ethnic groups. The most common excuse is, this house is limited to vegetarians only. Those posting Black Lives Matter, can you look inward first? <clears throat> the tweet generated thousands of responses. Many applauded Shiksha's courage for calling out racism in her own Kenyan Asian community. Many black Kenyans in turn shared their own stories of racist discrimination at the hands of Kenyan Asian landlords and employers. One Twitter user responded with this. And another, Abdullahi, responded by saying, Kenyan Indian CEO, call them Indians, meaning they're not Kenyan Indians, call them Indians. I hope these tweets give you a sense of the kind of contemporary relevance of these black brown stereotypes and tensions. However, I also want to emphasize that many of the most prominent anti-racist activists in Kenya, past and present, are Kenyan Asian. On the right of the screen here, you see Makan Singh, who's the founding father of trade unionism in Kenya and a very significant figure in the anti-colonial struggle. On the left, I've put a biography of Zarina Patel, who continues to be a leading voice for a Kenya that exceeds racial divisions. There's a lot of excellent scholarship on both of these figures and indeed on Kenyan Asians in general. However, as Godwin Siundu has observed, most of the literature on Kenyan Asians is either historical or literary. It's often written in quite general terms about Asians in the region as a whole, or it's centered on the lives of prominent figures based in Nairobi. What we see very little of in this scholarship on Asians in Kenya <clears throat> is stories of their contemporary everyday life. And this is really what I want to foreground today. So what I want to ask is beyond the racial stereotypes and the lives of prominent anti-racist activists in Nairobi, how is race actually being negotiated in everyday life? And I want to focus on Mombasa, uh, partly because, as, as, as I'll explain in a moment, Mombasa is a very different place to Nairobi. And this is significant because, as we know, race is not a fixed and unchanging social fact. It is shifting um, and it's, it's always shifting and it's geographically, geographically and historically specific. Hence the need to look at how it actually functions in very different locales. I'm also going to foreground um, the voices, and particularly one voice, of, an old, of older working class Muslim Kenyan Asian women. Part of my reason for focusing on this demographic specifically is to kind of complicate the stereotype that all Asians are wealthy, property-owning Hindu vegetarians. 
But I also want to, to, to focus on, on older working class Muslim Kenyan Asian women to kind of complement what I see as a prevailing focus on youth in most of the recent ethnographies of African cities. Racialized minorities and older people are really underrepresented in this body of literature. Okay, so this shows you a map of Mombasa and the municipality, the, the city actually extends about like this in the area that I'm showing you with the red arrow. However, as you can also see, the center of the city is really focused on this island, which is Mombasa Island, also known as Mvita. The city has about 1.2 million inhabitants, and although it's hard to uh, give an exact number, I think approximately 20 to 30,000 of these are Kenyan Asian. Most of what I'm going to be talking about today is actually based on ethnography conducted in Old Town, which is a very small neighborhood in the southeast corner of the island. And it's a very distinct area of the city. As the name suggests, historically, Old Town was the political, economic and religious center of Mombasa. And it remains widely perceived as its Muslim heart. The area is densely populated. Um, it has many sort of tiny streets and alleyways, and it's mostly inhabited by Swahili, Arab, and Asian families who have lived in the area for a long time. Many of the area's historically wealthy families have since moved away, and a number, or most indeed, of its once grand houses are now very dilapidated. The area has always and, and continues to also include many extremely modest homes and a number of people and a lot of the people who live there um, subsist on very meager incomes. A recent example that shows you or that sort of illustrates um, the, the Old Town's distinction in relation to both the rest of the city and indeed to the rest of Kenya is the fact that during the start of the coronavirus pandemic in, in Kenya earlier this year, Old Town was one of only two areas in the whole country that was actually locked down with um, movement in and out of the area strongly um, controlled, strictly controlled. And this was very much seen as an anti, as a political anti-Muslim move rather than anything motivated by public health concerns. And here we can see in the photo a lot of rubbish piling out on one of the um, edges of Old Town due to the absence of municipal authorities in the area during this period. Okay, um, this uh, graffiti, Pwanisi Kenya, meaning the coast is not Kenya, is common all around Mombasa, including in Old Town. The slogan has been in circulation for many decades, and it's really a rallying cry, both for successionists, but also for others attempting to both articulate and address decades of marginalization of the coast at the hands of the central state. To put it simply, the coast is urban and Muslim and has been so for centuries, and this pits it in direct opposition to the rest of the country, and indeed to the foundational pillars of Kenyan nationalism, which imagines Kenya as based on rural Christian tribes. There's a very strong sense at the coast that, that the, the region is economically and politically marginalized because it is Muslim. And I should emphasize that the prejudices between the coast and the upcountry really go both ways. People from the coast, have long seen themselves um, as superior to the less civilized inhabitants from inland. And from in the perspective of inland Kenyans, the coast is seen as a kind of exotic internal orient. And um, I use this, uh, I borrow this term from, from Andy Eisenberg. Okay, despite these, you can't hear me as well? Can you hear me? We can, but it's the audience that says you have to speak up. Ah, okay. Uh, how's my... Can you hear me now? Do you hear? 
My computer audio is in max. Okay. 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 I hope you can all hear me. Please do say yeah, in the good. chats yeah. if. Uh, okay. So, um, oh, just to go back a little bit, so the prejudices between the coast and upcountry really go both ways. People from the coast um, have long seen themselves as sort of superior to the allegedly less civilized inhabitants from inland. Um, and from the perspective of, of people from upcountry Kenya, the coast is often seen as a kind of exotic internal orient. Um, and I borrow this term from Andy Eisenberg. So despite these differences uh, between uh, the coast and the rest of Kenya, people from upcountry uh, have long flocked to Mombasa in search of work. And for, from the perspective of people at the coast, this, uh, the kind of enduring upcountry presence is really kind of felt as a persistent invasion. And this sentiment was summarized to me by a prominent Swahili Sheikh um, during a conversation we had when we met. He said, from the 60s to the 90s, Mombasa belonged to the Mombasans. <clears throat> when I probed him a little, he said, he, he kind of continued and said, you only have to look around you. The city has been taken over by Kikuyus and Somalis. Kikuyus are from central Kenya. They're one of the largest ethnic groups or tribes in the country and have really dominated post-colonial Kenyan politics. As I think the quote from the Sheikh uh, illustrates well, uh, the Kikuyus are widely reviled at the coast. On the other hand, for many upcountry Kenyans, long-standing prejudices towards the Muslim coast have really been entrenched <laughs> since the US embassy bombings in Nairobi and Dar es Salaam in 1998. And this date really marks the beginning of the war on terror in East Africa. The bombings led to um, the massive expansion of security infrastructures and counter-terrorism operations in Kenya. And these have really been bankrolled and very much encouraged and led by the, e the US and the EU. From the, for, in many ways, the crux of this strategy has really focused on targeting Muslims from the coast of Swahili and Arab descent, as well as Somali Muslims throughout the country. Uh, and the sort of uh, counter-terrorism operations have often involved raids on mosques. And during this period, thousands of young Muslim men uh, and Muslim clerics have been arrested, killed and disappeared. And the sort of um, um, this, the kind of violence of uh, Kenyan state security forces and the many extrajudicial killings are very well documented. As with coastal Muslims, prejudices against Somalis have an extremely long history in Kenya and have only become more solidified with the rise of Al-Shabaab in the region. This, and this is linked in no small way to Kenya's ongoing war in Somalia. Kenya invaded Somalia in 2011 and remains um, in the southern part of the country. Okay, so all of this is background. I hope some of you heard some of it um, to the context in which I'm now going to talk about nostalgia. Okay, so nostalgia is a phenomenon that I've no doubt that you'll all be familiar with. It occurs throughout history and across space. It's a common trope around the world. So when I first heard kind of nostalgic discourses in Mombasa, I wasn't particularly surprised. However, what struck me after only a few weeks of field work was how ubiquitous nostalgia was in the city. I heard frequent laments for a Mombasa that was. Longings for a more glorious and harmonious city now seem to be irreparably in decline. When I heard it from Kenyan Asians, I wondered at first if it was simply nostalgia for privileges of the colonial era. And I think there's certainly an element of that. However, I soon realized that nostalgia was a standard narrative in the city, articulated by old and young alike, and by people from many different backgrounds. I certainly heard it from all my Asian, Swahili, and Arab interlocutors, and it's also been reported by other anthropologists working with Swahili communities in the city. As an anthropologist, when you kind of uh, recognize a standard narrative, you have to ask, what does it do? What's its social function? And what I want to argue today is that I think this mode of urban discourse that I refer to as nostalgia talk 
is really implicated in the making and unmaking of racial orders in Mombasa. Specifically, what I want to argue is that nostalgia talk both asserts interracial or multiracial urban solidarities while also excluding racialized others. Okay, and I want to talk you through nostalgia in Mombasa through the narratives of a particular individual who I'm going to call Fatima. I will focus on highlighting Fatima's narratives here, but the arguments I make are really informed by many, many conversations with a large number of Muslim Kenyan Asian women resident in Old Town. So Fatima is in her 60s. She was born and raised in Old Town, as were her parents and her grandparents. She spoke Kutchi at home to her parents, but she really also grew up speaking a mix of Swahili, English and Gujarati, as well as a little Arabic and Urdu. Fatima is a devout Sunni. She belongs to the Memem community or Jamaat, which is one of tens of, which is one of tens of different Kenyan Asian Sunni communities in Mombasa, not to mention the various Shia, Hindu, Jain, Sikh and Christian communities. So most of Fatima's intimate friends and relatives are from the same Memem community, and she's certainly very proud of her Indian heritage. But she doesn't really remember where her parents, where her great grandparents migrated from, and her relationship to, Indi to India in the present um, is really not very present. Fatima is a survivor of two abusive marriages. And she now lives in an apartment complex uh, near where this photo that you can see in the slide was taken, an apartment complex reserved for widows in her community or other women who have no other means of support. The building is very dilapidated and it consists of about 15 um, studio apartments around a kind of internal courtyard. Fatima would often say things to me like, I'm poor, but I won't starve. She's entirely dependent on welfare support from her jamaat or religious community who pay her rent, provide her with food rations and give her a weekly allowance, a, a very small one. And they also sub subsidize her medical um, expenses. Fatima is very cognizant that it's this welfare support that differentiates her from other poor Kenyans. She, she, she noted often that most other Kenyans simply don't have this kind of net. And to varying degrees, all the different Kenyan Asian communities in Mombasa and indeed in, in, in the region as a whole, provide similar welfare provisions to members of their specific religious and caste community. Iqbal Akhtar has argued that you might wanna think of these communities functioning as kind of religious welfare states. And I think these, these politically, sorry, these religiously and racially defined welfare networks are really central to the political economy of race in Kenya, in the sense that while they evidently provide essential support to people like Fatima, they also prevent working class organization across racial lines. I'm not going to say much more about these now, but, but perhaps we can um, talk uh, further in the discussion on this, on this matter. Okay, for Fatima, urban life really consists of um, her home, occasional visits to mosque whenever her jamaat pays her tuk-tuk fare, which isn't that often, and daily walks through Old Town to Markiti, the main marketplace, also known as McKinnon. And you can see a photo from inside the market um, on the slide. These days, Fatima visits friends relatively rarely. However, she continues to go every Saturday to share homemade mahamri, a popular local donut, with Salwa, one of her Swahili neighbors. And the transaction is always accompanied by much tea and gossip. Like most other women, or like almost all the women who live in Old Town, whenever Fatima goes out of the house, she wears a headscarf or hijab covering her uh, her hair and framing her face like this, as well as a long black bui bui, which is a kind of long black outer garment that covers her arms and the whole of her body. Uh, on her way to the market, she greets many of the area's residents, as well as the street vendors and store owners that she knows. And she sometimes has longer conversations with the female fruit and vegetable sellers, 
She's particularly fond of Zara, a Somali woman with an extremely warm personality and the freshest carrots. At least this is Fatima's opinion. <clears throat> So, Fatima's Mombasa is now centered almost exclusively on Old Town, but this wasn't always the case. Some of her fe fe fondest memories from her youth are of strolling with her siblings to Lighthouse, an area on the southern, um, southern coast of Mombasa Island with panoramic views of the Indian Ocean. And it indeed used to house a lighthouse, which gives the, the area its name. When she was young, Fatima and her family would usually head to Lighthouse sometime around sunset or after dinner to soak up the cool ocean breeze, watch the stars and indulge in some hogo or cassava chips, which you can see in the slide. And these would be sold by street vendors who indeed continue to congregate in the area. In Fatima's adolescence, Lighthouse in the evenings would be heaving with people in, in milling about, greeting each other, sharing news of the day and enjoying the views. Can you imagine, she asked me, we used to walk there, there and back at night. Mombasa was so safe in those days. She shook her head to emphasize what a different time that was. Strolling at night is certainly no longer a common Mombasa pastime. Today, Lighthouse is still a popular spot, but the atmosphere is very different. Most people who frequent the area at night sit in their cars, usually behind tinted windows. There's, they can still buy mogo and other delic delicacies from street food vendors, but there's very little milling at night. Lighthouse has become a largely private affair, at least when darkness falls. Fatima hasn't been to the area for decades, not least because she is worried about security and has no male companion to go with. But she also doesn't understand the appeal. Why would you go to watch the ocean from your car? For Fatima, the whole point of Lighthouse was the breeze and the people. Another of Fatima's favorite modes of nostalgia talk related to the glory days of Mombasa's cinema scene. The city used to count several Art Deco cinema houses, all of which have now closed or been destroyed and transformed. The only cinema still standing, which you can see in the slide, is Moons, although this too closed many years ago. All of the cinemas were established and run by Asians, but they catered to a broad clientele. As Andy Eisenberg has noted, between the 1950s and the mid-1990s, going to see a Bollywood film at a local cinema was the most popular form of leisure for most Mombasans. Fatima's favorite was Majestic, which was located in Old Town. Wednesdays was ladies' night, she told me on one occasion. If you lived in Old Town, you were there. Bollywood films were the staple and much gossip, gossip ensued before and after each screening. During my conversation with Fatima, I asked if she'd ever been to Cineplex, the only cinema hall in Mombasa these days, which is located in Nyali, an elite, northern, an, an elite suburb on the northern mainland. Fatima looked at me skeptically and shook her head. Nigali sana. She stressed how expensive Cineplex was in Kiswahili and then gave me a more mischievous look, telling me that she heard that, they, the Cine, that Cineplex didn't even sell sesame seeds. I was a bit confused and she explained that back in the old days, after the end of each screening at the Art Deco cinemas, the, the floors of the cinema actually used to crunch with the sound of sesame seed shells that people would have dropped during, during snacking. Um, and, and sesame seeds were really the kind of favorite cinematic snack. So what is this genre of nostalgia talk doing? For Kenyan Asians like Fatima, I see nostalgia talk as a way of claiming a kind of rooted urban belonging being nostalgic for pastimes and places that no longer exist or have been changed, emphasizes the longevity of her connection to the city and allows her to assert a kind of localness that cannot be claimed by skin color. In addition, because the cinemas and many of the other institutions that she and others remember so fondly were owned and run by Asians, these narratives really underscore Asian contributions to the history of the city. 
Nostalgia Talk writes Asians into the history of Mombasa, invoking precisely what Akile Mbembe has called for, an expansive interpretation of Africanity that has always been co-constructed by people who are not black. In other words, these narratives contest the conflation of racial and territorial belonging that has characterized post-colonial politics in Kenya and the, and the continent more broadly. However, as I hope is clear from the vignettes, while some of these anchors for nostalgia may have been built by Asians, all were frequented by a broad range of Mombasans, particularly others of Swahili and Arab descent, also resident on the island. In this sense, I interpret nostalgia talk as invoking long histories of multiracial conviviality. And this is a term that has uh, been developed by Paul Gilroy and taken up by many others to describe how people live together in and across differences. And I think that's precisely what nostalgia talk does. For a broad range of Mombasans from many different backgrounds, Nostalgia Talk emphasizes long histories of connection to the city and to each other. Now, this strong sense of multiracial conviviality will come as no surprise to those of you who have visited Mombasa. But what I want to emphasize here is the extent to which nostalgic discourses challenge prevailing national stereotypes of racialized hostility between black and brown Kenyans. This is not to suggest that racism does not between black and brown Kenyans is absent in Mombasa. However, what is asserted in the city's pervasive penchant for nostalgia are deep and nuanced interracial entanglements. And a this is a marked contrast from some of the tweets we saw earlier. At the same time, I think it's, I, I hope what came through in the, in the vignettes is that Nostalgia talk both asserts and critiques inequality. Nostalgia glosses the fact that the, the kind of patterns of consumption that Fatima remembers so fondly were never really available to the poorest Mombasans. And I think these, these, these narratives really emphasize a kind of difference that is both racial, class, and geographic between residents of the island, mostly those of Arab, Swahili, and Asian descent, in contrast to the poorer upcountry laborers, um, either Michikenda or from upcountry, who live in other areas of the mainland. At the same time as kind of asserting this inequality, nostalgia uh, for, for people like nostalgia talk for people like Fatima, who remain poor, is also a kind of critique of rising inequality. As Fatima suggests, with both the cars at Lighthouse and the prices at Cineplex, wealthy Mombasans now have new modes and spaces of consumption that are simply not accessible to people in her income bracket. In other words, her narratives emphasize the marked reduction of spaces for multiracial encounter available to those without much money and speak to the kind of entrenchment of class and racial divisions that wealth accumulation um, has pro have produced in Mombasa, with elites increasingly living the city by way of racialized, uh, by way of gated wet residences, many of which are racialized, expensive shopping malls, and four-wheel drive cars. Now, what I've highlighted so far is a kind of genre of nostalgia talk that really emphasizes loss. Another genre of nostalgia in Mombasa pertains to arrival. So, <clears throat> on our walks through Old Town, Fatima would often point to piles of rubbish on the street and shake her head. This area used to be so clean, she told me on many occasions. Now you see rubbish everywhere. It's all since the Somalis came. Some Somali families have lived in Mombasa for generations, but the widespread feeling amongst my interlocutors was that it was particularly since the Somali civil war in the 1990s, and then even more so with the rise of Al-Shabaab in the 2000s, that the Somali population in Old Town and the city more widely had grown significantly. <clears throat> in Old Town, Somalis were widely blamed for rising levels of rubbish, crime, and drug use. 
Their soul not was the rabu, Fatima sighed one afternoon, using the Kisuki Swahili word for civilized to stress what Somalis allegedly lacked. Fatima was also keen to point out cafes and shops that she described as being taken over by Somalis. When we walked past the cafe that you can see in the slide one afternoon, she pointed to the word banadir, which you can see painted here. Banadir, I learned <clears throat> in that during that walk, is the region of um, Somalia that surrounds Mogadishu. Fatima told me that when she was younger, the cafe used to sell the best meat pies or some of the best meat pies in Mombasa. So I asked her if she'd been inside since it had changed hands. Her answer was unequivocal. In order to do business, you have to be clean, no? She said, associating the current owners with a lack of personal hygiene. Okay, in addition to these kind of racist discourses against Somalis, Fatima certainly shared the views of the Sheikh that I mentioned earlier, um, that Mombasa was now also overrun by people from up country, particularly Kikuyus. However, perhaps because almost no one from up country actually lives in Old Town, uh, for Fatima, pe uh, people from inland Kenya were a pervasive but somewhat amorphous threat. They weren't on her doorstep, unlike Somalis. Walking through her neighborhood, what really upset Fatima the most, however, was the rising number of women in Old Town dressed in niqab. As I hope you can see in the image, I'm sorry if it's a bit small, um, the niqab is a face veil that only exposes the eyes, so every other part of the face is covered. Whenever we passed a woman with this kind of face covering, Fatima would shake her head and, and sort of tut discreetly by way of disapproval. Women in Mombasa never used to dress like this, she asserted frequently. It's only the Somali ladies. Fatima saw the niqab as an indicator of the oppression of women in Somali society and as proof of Somali fundamentalism specifically of Somali adherence to the Salafist version of Islam referred to by many in Mombasa as Wahhabism. Fatima and most other Muslims I met in the city spoke longingly of, the peaceful mo of a peaceful Muslim coexistence of old, a harmonious time marked by mutual respect, as well as the absence of violent sectarianism and terror. And it was this peaceful past that was painted as being disrupted by Wahhabis in general and by Somalis in particular. Wahhabis are the ones doing all these terror attacks, Fatima assured me. She had been particularly shocked by the shooting of two white tourists in two separate incidences in Old Town in the summer of 2014. No one was ever prosecuted for these shootings, but in the mind of Fatima and many others, the links between the niqab, Somalis, Wahhabis, and terror were firmly cemented. Now, needless to say, all these assertions are deeply problematic. Most Somalis in Kenya are Shafi Sunni and not Wahhabi, and Wahhabism and sectarian divisions have a long history at the coast that well predate uh, the growth of the city's Somali population. However, these tropes persist and are very much cemented by nostalgia talk. Okay, so I think what comes through in these narratives is that nostalgia talk really creates a kind of racialized hierarchy of urban belonging. Nostalgia, talk, nostalgia constructs a sense of affinity between residents with rooted urban and coastal histories, united by a shared appreciation of the city's decline. At the same time, this mode of narration asserts that the city belongs to some people more than others. And I think in this way, Nostalgia Talk strives to contest and critique the continuing growth of Mombasa's upcountry and Somali populations and serves as a trope via which residents with longer histories at the coast seek to shore up their claims to the city. What we also see very clearly in the discourses against Somalis is the racialization of socioeconomic and political insecurity in Mombasa. Nostalgia talk was often a vehicle for anti-Somali racism. 
nostalgia for an old town before the niqab, before the takeover of many businesses, and before crime and terror became pervasive urban concerns, all construct Somalis as the, or all serve to construct Somalis as the kind of ultimate racial and religious other. These discourses position Somalis as the source of contemporary urban insecurity, diverting attention away from structural forces, such as the neoliberal economic policies that have decimated state services in Mombasa, or state violence against Muslims across the world that really drive terror and counter-terror in East Africa. Now, as I'm sure many of you have recognized, um, these sort of ahistorical nostalgic fantasies for the days before racialized others um, have strong parallels in many other contexts, not least in sort of anti-migrant, um, anti-Muslim Britain, that's just one example. But I think in every location, these discourses are mobilized for a variety of different ends. And in Mombasa, I think one of the most critical reasons that we see this kind of racialization of security, that we see this blaming of Somalis for contemporary insecurity, is really an attempt um, by coastal Muslims to defend themselves against the accusation that it is they who are responsible for terrorism and other urban problems. Nostalgic laments for a Muslim harmony of old strives to sort of construct good coastal Muslims in contrast to bad Somali Muslims. And I take this distinction obviously from Mahmoud Mandami. So here I should just kind of uh, underline um, that although Muslim Kenyan Asians like Fatima are not the target of state counterterrorism initiatives um, in the same way that Somali and Arab Muslims are, you can see, I hope, from the narratives that Fatima was very much a part of these nostalgic efforts to defend her city and fellow Muslim residents. Okay, so just to conclude, the key points that I really uh, want you to take away from today is that I think <coughs> nostalgia talk is a sort of complex racializing phenomena, a force that both asserts interracial intimacies at the same time as forging racialized boundaries. Nostalgia, in other words, can be both racist and a challenge to racialized social divisions. Nostalgia talk in this sense, I think really emphasizes and exposes the entanglements of multiracial conviviality and racism in Mombasa. These seemingly um, opposing modes of relating um, to other people really coexist and co-produce each other. Finally, as I've sought to show, I think that unpacking these entanglements really necessitates an approach to processes of racialization that focus on everyday life. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Zoe. Are you